thank you very much for being here. And actually, they have arrived. So I'm going to actually turn it over to the amazing Rob Busher, who is uh, our lovely moderator for this event. All right. Well, thank you, Veronica, and uh, thank you to everyone for being here this evening. I'm going to try my best to speak into this mic as it's uh, helping the video recording. Um, in any case, my name is Rob Busher. Um, I've been working with Opera Philadelphia in an advisory capacity for the last couple of years on the Community Advisory Council, um, something that has grown out of some of the conversations that the Asian American community was having with Opera Philadelphia in the wake of the 2016 Turndot production. Um, that's something that I'll kind of go into in greater detail during the opening parts of the panel, so I'll save that for now. But uh, just as some brief background on myself, I'm a mixed race Japanese American. Uh, most of my career has dealt with organizing film festivals. I spent seven seasons as the festival director for the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival and the last three seasons as their board chair. Uh, currently, I work at the Japan America Society of Greater Philadelphia, and I teach Asian American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. So um, rather than introducing my panelists, because uh, I feel like everyone who reads bios always messes something up, I'd love to turn it over to each of our fantastic panelists to do self-introductions, uh, starting with Makoto. Great. Is this on? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Makoto and uh, Hirano, and uh, I'm a choreographer. And I'm Philadelphia-based. Uh, I'm a co-founder of my own company called Team Sunshine. And I'm also a creator performer in the opera Philadelphia's production of The Raven. Uh, I am, I'm doing a thing where uh, I, do, I do a lot of things in the arts. And I'm going through a thing where I'm, I think it's called mid-career, where I'm dropping all of the other things. I'd still do them. I'm just calling myself a choreographer, and I'm just trying it out. So uh, that's me. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Will Gardner, and I teach um, at Swarthmore College. And um, I teach uh, Japanese language and literature and film there. Um, and um, I'm um, not an expert on opera um, or uh, theater, per se, but I do. Um, have an um, interest in opera and, um, and, and music. And um, I also uh, had a chance to, actually, I don't know if Rob knew this when he invited me to be on the panel, but uh, there was a um, symposium on Edgar Allan Poe and Japan in Philadelphia. Um, and we, we went to the Poe House um, here in Philadelphia, and there were a group of scholars from Japan um, talking about Poe's influence in Japan. So um, uh, when Rob asked me to, to talk about Poe and Japan as a, as a member of this panel, um, I, I flashed back to, to that um, terrific experience. But uh, I do work on modern literature as far as my own research is concerned. Modern literature, and particularly um, modernism in the 1920s in Japan. So that's my research field. Great, thank you both so much. So in terms of a brief overview, uh, at this point, I'm going to be talking a little bit about sort of the genesis of the Community Advisory Council and, and how this has kind of led to and informed some of the conversations that actually uh, allowed Opera Philadelphia to come to this place where they're presenting Hosokawa's The Raven. And uh, following that, we're going to kind of delve a little bit into the history of uh, modern Japanese literature and this kind of transnational exchange between US and Japan, popular culture. Um, uh, following that, we're going to turn it over to Makoto to talk a little bit about the genesis of the particular production, uh, which I hope you've all had a chance to see. And if not, we'll be catching a performance of later this week. And finally, kind of close out our discussion with uh, open panel discussion on the aspects of uh, national culture and identity and whether it's actually possible to understand or quantify something as a national art form um, in the way that we might have traditionally done so. Um, so yeah, just to kind of kick things off, I'm going to take this off because it's a little awkward to speak into the mic like that. Um, the way that the Opera Philadelphia approached um, the 
productions related to Asia and Asian Americans, I think is like very many opera companies historically where there was not historically a, a relationship uh, in any um, significant way, um, not necessarily in part to anyone's fault, but more so because historically the audience base of operas have not really included the Asian diaspora um, in a significant population. Um, so part of the, the challenge um, when it comes, I think, to historic and traditional art forms is that there are certain topics within the canon that have reinforced and in some ways propagated stereotypes. And this is particularly true of Puccini's two Orientalist uh, productions, Turandot and Madama Butterfly, which uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, Asian American community organizers and, and certainly folks working in sort of arts and culture and entertainment have uh, taken issue with in the ways that it has been presented. Um, so in 2016, uh, when Opera Philadelphia was preparing to produce the Turandot Opera, um, there were some concerns, of course, from the Asian American community, and it particularly manifested around the way in which the advertising and the language to, used to describe the production as an exotic adventure, as well as some of the makeup choices, which um, we understand uh, were informed by kind of the, the set design and wardrobe that was part of the touring program. Um, but, you know, for local Asian American community members, uh, we saw elements of uh, yellow face within the stage makeup. So after a series of lengthy conversations between the opera company, the Asian American uh, theater community, as well as the Japanese American Citizens League, the uh, Japanese American civil rights organization that I'm also a member of. Um, we came to an agreement to essentially remove the aspects of the staging and the wardrobe that the community found to be most problematic. And we were able to move forward with a compromise that allowed for some discourse to kind of take place, both within the educational materials that were being presented within the opera's education guide, as well as one of the audience talkbacks. Uh, we even developed a couple of posters that were hanging in the opera lobby that talked about the history of Yellow Face and kind of talking about issues that, that were represented historically within Turandot that needed to be addressed in order for the Asian American community to feel that this was something that we could support and, and open up a real conversation with going forward. So that was 2016, and a lot has happened in the world and a lot has happened in our society here in the United States since then. And I think we've really come to an understanding and a reckoning in certain ways about social justice and specifically racial justice when it comes to matters of representation. Um, when you think about where even Hollywood film was at in 2016, uh, this is, you know, the year that Scarlett Johansson played Motoko Kusanagi in Ghost in the Shell. Um, so the, the kind of use of, uh, you know, white actors in, in either yellow face or at least sort of roles that have historically or, or culturally been assigned to East Asian or Asian American individuals is something that I think was fairly rampant in society at that time period. Um, and as a, as a society, I, I do think that we've started to learn from some of these mistakes from the past, and I'm happy to say that uh, with our relationship to Opera Philadelphia, the local Asian American creative community and uh, advocacy community has really worked in partnership over the last six years, uh, since 2016, to have meaningful conversations and dialogue about what it means to present works of art that have historically been part of this problem in terms of uh, stereotypes and uh, negative um, realities in, in the ways that they've manifested within the culture. Um, so I think it was in 2020, or 2019 rather, the year before the pandemic, this same group uh, was called back to the opera company to start conversation around uh, doing a production of Madama Butterfly. And, and so at that point, the conversation was, how do we do this production in a way that both acknowledges some of the historical issues with the stereotypes, while also allowing people to embrace and understand and accept the parts that are good. And I think um, a lot of times with these historical art forms, 
it is necessary to acknowledge that we can still appreciate the art while not necessarily throwing it away, but finding new ways to present this work that is meaningful and, and less offensive to the communities that have been historically impacted by these productions. And so that was kind of the general tone of the conversation, and uh, we all felt pretty good about where that was headed, and of course COVID happened. So uh, with 2020 and the COVID pandemic, uh, there was an initial move to postpone Madama Butterfly. And then unfortunately, March 16th, 2021, the Atlanta spa shootings happened. And um, as you're all probably aware, six of the eight victims of those shootings were Asian American women who were targeted because there was an assumption made about their profession being sex workers. Uh, because they happen to work at massage parlors and happen to be Asian. So in the aftermath of that uh, terrible, tragic incident, uh, the opera company decided it was time to, to call it quits on Madama Butterfly, at least for the time being, acknowledging that some of the stereotypes related to Asian women, specifically East Asian women, had been uh, brought about by productions like Madama Butterfly. And it's not like a singular play creates this idea within our culture, but it is something that is built upon. When popular culture is self-referential and we have uh, movements that span generations and decades and art forms that are also kind of sharing the content, we start to build upon these kernels of the ori original popular culture. And unfortunately, this is how these uh, ideas manifest within our culture and in perpetuity. So acknowledging all of this, what ultimately did come to pass was that the opera company started to ask a lot of questions and listen. And the opera company came back to the table and said, we understand that this particular production at this moment in time would be a very bad idea and we want to instead invest in the Asian American and specifically the Japanese and Japanese American communities because Madama Butterfly historically has been a, a conversation around US and Japan, and uh, there's a lot of power, power imbalance and dynamics related to the role that the United States played at that time period in Asia Pacific and quasi-imperialism that was taking place in that US-Japan relationship. Um, and so as a way, I think also to do some restorative justice, there's an opportunity that was presented to the Community Advisory Council that perhaps we could actually invest in a Japanese or Japanese American opera artist and uh, ultimately do some kind of production that reflects the community or the culture in a positive light um, that would also be investing in performers that come from the Japanese and Japanese American community. And so, uh, long story short, um, essentially this is how we landed on doing The Raven and bringing in Arya Umezawa, the Japanese Canadian theater director, uh, the Raven, composed by Toshio Hosokawa, Japanese composer, and ultimately working with the uh, Asian American theater community here in Philadelphia to incorporate uh, very talented actors like Makoto here into the production. So um, in six years, I would say that it's been incredible to see how Opera Philadelphia has, in my opinion, truly understood and grown from the original issues that we were having back in 2016. And together uh, with the Asian American theater community have really built something incredible with this production. So that was kind of the, the context that I wanted to provide um, up until that point. And um, I, since Makota was here for most of that, I just wanted to ask if you'd like to comment yeah. or add anything before we move on. You did, that's so good, Rob, you're so, you're so you're so good at speaking. i like, um, you. You did all of it. There are a couple things that I want to throw in, and then I'll and then I'll jump to like now. Um, one thing, uh, shout out to Rob because back in 2015, when before Turned Out was uh, before this the the production was staged here, Rob was like, hmm, because he I don't know you saw some stuff or you read something and whatever it was, and you were like, Upper Philadelphia is doing this thing. I'm not sure about it. Yo, let's get together and talk about it. And so Rob invited myself and a bunch of other people to have a conversation with, uh, well, Rob was like, hey, we, uh, we are strong, we are proud, we have power, and we have voice, 
and you might want to listen to us in case you're going to do a bunch of yellow face on stage. Not saying you're going to, but if you might, you might want to talk to us. And so Rob was, um, yeah, Rob knocked on Opera Philadelphia's door. And it took roughly five months. Does that seem right? For, and then they, they got back to Rob. It took five months for them to respond, for, them, for the Opera Philadelphia staff, uh, whoever you wrote to to get back to Rob. They did, which is dope, but it took that long. And then, um, and then everything else you said, but uh, I'm just shouting you out because that conversation didn't just happen. It was because Rob was like, I think we, I think we want to do this. I think we want to be at the table. And uh, Rob uh, created a table for us. And then we came together around it. So that's the thing. Uh, another thing is that uh, and I've been to a bunch of these meetings, and in the, the March 2021 meeting, uh, a Zoom meeting, uh, there was a moment where, uh, where David, the president, was like, um, should we even do this production? It, was, it wasn't being canceled, uh, or, post or it was postponed, but they weren't sure if, um, what they were gonna do with it, and how they were gonna stage it, and how, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was a question put out, which was, uh, should we, being Opera Philadelphia, should we even do Madame of a Butterfly? Is there a way to do it and do it uh, in, a, in a way that's equitable and that's caring and empathetic and that's um, open, that opens dialogue? Uh, or should we not even try? And I thought when that question was being asked that it was mostly rhetorical, that there was no way that seven or 12 Asian American people in a Zoom room can say, don't do it, and that they wouldn't do it. I was like, that's not going to happen. But we, we made our voices very clear, our perspectives very clear. And I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that Opera Philadelphia was already feeling that way. But the fact that they, yeah, just very openly put that question out. And we, um, you yeah, know, we shared our opinions around it. And, uh, and then they didn't do it. I'm like, that's, I don't know. I still think about that. I like weirdly, fondly think about that, that time. Because uh, Opera Philadelphia is a giant institution. And giant institutions generally, typically, historically, have never reached out to uh, you know, marginalized communities to be like, hey, should we do this or not? Should we not do this or that? Um, and that felt, yeah, that felt like a really real turning point. It felt like really, I guess in some ways, putting their money where their mouth was as far as inviting us to the table over and over and, mm -hmm. and continuing to be in dialogue with us. So those things, um, to give a little more context to what Rob was saying. Uh, so fast forward a bunch to now-ish, or very recently. Uh, I don't know all the specifics of how Arya came into this. I don't know if you, you do, but I mean, Arya is a super hot, awesome, like, you know, just like crushing it as a stage director all around the country, uh, all around the world, I think. And so Arya comes into the fold. Arya understands sort of the context in which she is coming into, into Philadelphia, into this festival, into uh, the Raven, and says, uh, I think we need buy-in from the community, uh, from the, uh, the advisory committee, uh, advisory council. And then also we need local creator performers uh, of Asian descent to be part of this and to create something new uh, to sort of be in tandem with or adjacent to or to go along with uh, the Raven. And uh, Arya, did <laughs> Arya did some Googling and she found a company called Obvious Agency. And Obvious Agency is a local uh, a Philadelphia-based uh, interactive performance company. And they sort of blur lines between audience performer and game and theater. And so uh, she was like, I think these guys are cool. <laughs> I, want, I think I want to work with them. And Opera Philadelphia was like, great, whatever you want. We can support that. And Obvious Agency is a group of four, uh, it's an ensemble of four. And they work with sort of ad hoc performer creators. I am one of them. And so they reached out to me and be like, do you want to be part of this, this cohort, this group? And so we had Obvious Agency and six, seven, eight performer creators. And then we have Aria, the stage director, 
uh, a key, the conductor, and then the chamber uh, orchestra, uh, Kristen, the incredible singer. And so we have sort of these two halves coming together in the rehearsal room going like, what do we, what do we want to make? I mean, there's the Raven, which is a 45 minute experience. And then we're like, there's this vessel. It's the way Aria talks about it. She wants to create sort of a vessel uh, as a something, something that the Raven production is inside of, perhaps. And let's create the vessel for that. And uh, so it was sort of Aria and Aki, Maestro, and all these people, they're kind of first time making stuff. And for us, it was our first time doing an opera. And so all this uh, was happening in the studio. We had a week of workshops in, in the summer, and then we started rehearsals at the end of August. And by rehearsals, I mean they're just like creation rehearsals. We get together and improvise and, and throw out prompts and, and see what works. And we were like, wow, this is so cool. We're hanging out with opera people. And they're like, wow, this is so cool. We're making stuff. <laughs> and most of the making process, uh, in, sort of in my universe, is uh, like 90% of it is junk. We just make stuff, and then we're like, that was stupid. <laughs> we make stuff, and we're like, that really, that, nobody should ever watch that. Uh, and then there's like 10% of good stuff, and we start tweaking that. And that's what we did uh, for, for many weeks until, until the production went up. And it's been, uh, really joyful to be around so many, so many other Asian Asian American creator people, uh, and also from the opera side. There's like so many Asian and Asian American people and Japanese American people to be in the room, not doing some Asian stuff. That nobody asked us to be like super Asian on stage. Nobody asked us to do. Can you do like super Asian something something? Can you make it more Japanese? It was. Um, it was it was just a bunch of Asian and Asian people and people of color in a room making art together, and that's pretty rare too. So I'm thinking back to March of 2021 in that conversation and David asking us that question, which was yeah just unheard of in my experience. And then being in a room uh, so well supported, well resourced, well organized, uh, and like just having a time of our lives making stuff was like also pretty rare and so that gets us to where we are now yeah thank you for all of that makoto i think it, it gives a, a lot of excellent context on again the, the second part of that story and how the uh program of the raven really came to be in its current form i want to talk more about that in a little bit but for now i'd like to bring will into the conversation so, um, you know, another big focus of this panel, of course, is this idea of, of uh, transnational cultural exchange. And um, what does it mean for Opera Philadelphia to be putting on an opera that is composed by a Japanese composer uh, and then kind of set in the context of this discussion that we're having now about Asian and Asian American theater artists that are producing art, but from that perspective of not wanting to make it specifically Asian. And you know what does that even mean culturally? So we'll get to that point in a little bit. But again, um, Will, I would really love if you could talk a little bit about uh, the significance of Edgar Allan Poe and the kind of time period in which his work becomes popular in Japan and sort of the lasting legacy that Poe's work has had within Japanese modern literature. Um, sure. Um, <clears throat> So I, I guess um, you, you, one thing that I would, would also like to address, I think, is in this particular production, there are a lot of influences, I think, that Hosokawa, the composer, has had a long-standing engagement with no theater, right, um, as an inspiration for his work. So he has set a couple of operas. Um, Hanjo, one of them actually, I understand, is playing up in New York. Um, and Matsukaze, another... Um, opera based on a no play. So clearly he has a long engagement with classical sort of traditional Japanese theater, no theater, uh, a theatrical form going back to the 14th century. Can I ask uh, a question just, yeah. uh, just by show of hands? I'm not going to pick anyone, but yeah. do, uh, who's uh, familiar with no theater as a form? Wow. Right on, right on. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, no. <laughs> but... Um, yeah. Uh, um, so, um, yeah. So I, I think that that's like one sort of c 
context for this production that we see is like Hosokawa's interest in no and reading the Raven, I think, through no. And, and we have some remarks um, by the composer about thinking about approaching this poem as kind of through thinking about no um, and, and his long-standing engagement with that form. And when we think about no, um, no is a theater, um, obviously some folks are familiar with it. Um, it's, it's, it's very, so it goes back to the 14th century, so it's very old. It was, it was patronized really by the elite class, of um, high-ranking warriors and so forth. So it was something that um, is very slow-moving and kind of ceremonial and has uh, music and dance are very integral to the art form. Um, and in many cases, so there's a type of no that's really the type of no that we most often associate with the form that's called like dream or illusion no. It's called mugen no. Um, and um, that is really where often it's in two parts. And in, in, in the, f there's a, there are basically two actors, right? And you have a, 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 an actor who may be like a priest or something that is kind of moving through a landscape and encounters a spirit. Right? And then the spirit um, is often in disguise in the first part of the play um, and then reveals themselves. And it might be the spirit of um, a ghost, right? or it might be um, a god or a demon or even like the spirit of a tree, um, a spirit from nature. Um, so, so it is a process of like something manifesting themselves on stage and telling their story and often something which is repressed, maybe related to cultural trauma, you know, telling their, telling their story on the stage. You know? And so I think that for me, when I see this production and think about Hosokawa, I really see him sort of reading the Raven as the sort of calling down of some sort of presence right onto the stage like a, like a no play would. Um, so I see that, that relationship in, in this particular work. Um, and I'd be happy, you know, if we have a time later and folks are interested, I could break down some similarities with the no that I see in this, this production, as well as I think there are a lot of differences. It's, it's, it's clearly really nothing like a, a no play in its soundscape. And um, I think there's some interesting differences, you know, in this work from, from a traditional no play as well. But um, so that's, that's kind of one. One way I think of, of looking at this relationship is through Hosokawa and his engagement with No and reading Po kind of through No. But, but as Rob mentioned, there's much longer kind of history of reading No in Japan, uh, reading Po, excuse me, Edgar Allan Poe, um, who we know, uh, author of The Raven, but also author of a lot of crazy, um, creepy short stories, right? And, um, and it considered to be one of the fathers of the mystery genre, you know, uh, detective fiction genre. Um, so a really prolific, even or diverse, you know, um, prolix kind of, of writer creator um, who had a lot of kind of different influences in Japan, but important ones. Um, and so, I mean, I think to trace that relationship back. It's a much longer story, and there are maybe a number of different moments. But um, I mean, I think the first, again, you know, un to understand that relationship and the, the resonance that Poe has had in, and the resonance that Poe, as part of like a broader realm of like Gothic literature, has had in Japan, is I think even going back before the modern era to the end of the Tokugawa era. So the 19th century, basically when Po was alive, Japan was closed to the West, right? And um, so at that time, at the end of the Tokugawa era, there was a lot of political and social instability. And this was a time when actually folklore about ghosts and demons really thrived, right? And so we have something that's actually, there's kind of a boom of it worldwide now of yokai you know, which are like Japanese ghosts and goblins, right? Um, and their video games and 
um, all sorts of anime and things like that that uh, a lot of young people are really into, like yokai culture right now. Um, but that actually, to a large extent, goes back, I mean, it has roots going back to these no plays and, you know, much centuries old, but a lot of that folklore really comes from that late 19th century. And we have Kabuki, which is a much more popular theater, um, using a lot of those ghost tales and very dark, macabre tales at the end of the 19th century. Um, and so there was a, a love of sort of ghost stories, which told stories of revenge and social unrest and cultural resentments and things like that, that really the sort of dark forces in society, I think, were really coming to the fore at that time. Um, and then 1868, right, we have the Meiji Restoration and the sort of a new regime takes charge in Japan. Um, before that, Matthew, uh, Con yeah. Commodore Perry shows up, American um, Commodore, right, and um, basically, you know, says, Japan, you must open trade to the West or else. Um, and so we have this sort of Japanese encounter with Western imperial powers. And eventually, you know, Japan decides that it has to, you know, the, the leaders of Japan decide that they have to modernize and militarize um, their country quickly or else they will be victims of imperialism, right? And ultimately, as, as you know, Japan itself becomes an imperial power. Um, but um, so during that time, all the sort of Western you know, military, but also Western economy, but Western science and Western sort of rational, rationalism sort of come into Japan. And Western literature also comes to Japan. But primarily, you know, turn of the 19th, 20th century, um, realism and naturalism, which are sort of allied with rationalism and scientific thought, are kind of at the fore, right? But there are some writers who resist that. So I'm thinking of a writer like Izumi Kyoka um, or Tanizaki Junichiro, um, who are writers at the turn of the century who are drawn maybe more to romanticism or to decadent literature and, you know, people like, um, <clears throat> people like Poe, right? Um, people like Baudelaire. Um, and so they sort of seize upon Western Gothic literature as a sort of anti-rationalism, right? Anti sort of West. And, and so they take a piece of the West, but kind of use it against the predominant values that are being sort of, you know, expounded by the Meiji national state, right? So it's kind of a subversive romanticism. And they also ally that with exploring their own past and their own sort of history of those monsters and demons and supernatural events, right? So, um, so you know, if you want to read, uh, you know, Izumi Kyoka, I think would be a really good example of that type of, of work. So you have that around the turn of the century. And then I'm trying to be brief here. I'm mean, just a couple more things, but the, um, then around the 1920s, and that's the, this is the period that I study um, for my own research, you have um, kind of Japanese modernism taking place on the one hand, but you also have um, the sort of boom in Japanese detective fiction. Um, and uh, interestingly, so Poe is also kind of the father of detective fiction, right? With things like the murders in the Rue Morgue and stuff, stuff like that. But Poe also has this quirky sort of Gothic side to him, right? So, and, and when we see detective fiction from that era in Japan, it's also kind of interestingly sort of schizophrenic in that it's, it has that sort of Western rational, you know, the detective as this sort of fi fi figure of rational thought and deduction, right? Versus the, the psychology of the criminal, right? Which can be the most irrational element of society, right? Which brings, brings all of these irrational impulses to the fore and is almost a supernatural force in itself, right? So you have this kind of dual, duality. Um, and, and Japanese mystery writers of the 1920s um, sort of ally themselves with a kind of, some of them, with a kind of, I would say, countercultural movement of the time that's known as ero-guro nonsense, right? So it's erotic, grotesque, 
eroguro, yeah, erotic and grotesque and nonsensical, right? So, and the writer that's most associated with all of this um, actually is named Erogawa Rampo, right? So he took his pen name from the Japanese pronunciation of Edgar Allan Poe, becomes Erogawa Rampo, um, and he uses the kind, he uses the characters, meaning stroll like disorderly strolls along the Edo River, you know, which sounds very poetic. Um, but, and, and also ma makes you think of Baudelaire and the Flaneur, right? So, um, so it's a wonderful sort of multivalent pen name. Um, and his work is also really interesting, but very, can be very quirky and dark um, and subversive. And in fact, he, so he was writing in the 1920s and 1930s, and then when the Japan's military regime comes along, some of his works are actually censored and repressed, um, and he has to kind of change his writing style to, a, to adapt. But um, so I think that all of that becomes kind of the basis for like post-war modern popular culture, you know, which I would say is the, the latest iteration of all of this, right? It, which is like the love of Gothic fashion, and you know horror, and we have horror manga, and we have horror films. Um, so this kind of like fascination with the gothic, um, you know, is very much I think part of popular culture today. But it goes back really to those those earlier roots. Mm -hmm. um, do you yeah. think? Do you think someone someone can make the argument that that Poe Poe's writing influenced Japanese writers? Uh, a few decades later, mm -hmm. that then uh, influenced, you know, further sort of genres mm -hmm. within Japanese writing, mm -hmm. and then uh, informed or influenced manga and like, uh, I guess some some genres within manga, which then are being <clears throat> nowadays popularized in the states. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and also Japanese like horror films, like the Ringu, right? You know, that takes a lot of its inspiration, even though it's about modern media and modern life, right? It, but it, this is a film, it's a, kind of old by now, but you know, one of the classics is J-horror, right? Um, and it takes some of its inspiration also from those same sort of dark s stories from the late, you know, you know, the late Tokugawa era. Um, but um, so yeah, all of these threads, I think, are still coming together in popular culture today. And this Japanese popular culture is, is it's transnational in itself, right? So it's it's definitely something which is being adapted and appropriated and sort of you know reimagined in the United States and 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 in France and in Korea and around the world, you know. So um, so it's 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 really fascinating. I think all the different threads you have uh, going in all sorts of directions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Will. I think you've managed to succinctly summarize about 100 years of literary history. But, um, really also does show how important that this uh, transnational cultural exchange can be, uh, both within sort of national literature, national film movement, or uh, transnational exchange when it comes back here then to the United States. And I, I think it really, in a, a great case study, is a way that we can begin to try and understand uh, this concept of, of transnational cultural exchange and I think push back on this notion that such a thing as a national cultural identity exists in the first place. And I think that's really at the, the core of sort of both of these lines of conversation that we're having within this panel right now. Um, just a couple other things that I wanted to comment on related to, I guess, yokai and, and po in that time period because um, you know, so much of, of Japanese folk stories, so for context, my great-grandparents immigrated slightly after the time period that Will was first talking about, the turn of the 20th century. So um, on my great-grandmother's side, she was born in Hilo, Hawaii in the early decade of the 1900s. Her parents were plantation workers who left Hiroshima and went to the big island of Hawaii to grow sugarcane, as many did from that generation. And the stories that she grew up on um, that were told to her by her parents and later her grandparents when she returned to Japan to be raised in Hiroshima uh, were all of these kinds of stories, these yokai stories and um, the characters in, in these sort of uh, 
Japanese folk stories of the occult or the supernatural oftentimes are things that have then manifested in popular culture in, in different ways, as, as Will mentioned, like w with the ring or ringu, um, this idea of this sort of pale-faced, long, dark-haired yure or uh, female ghost vengeful spirit is deeply based within these kinds of yokai stories. Um, earlier in uh, this time period of the Meiji Restoration, um, another transnational connection for you, Lafcadio Hearn, an Irish folklorist, was one of the first Westerners to live in Japan and learn the Japanese language with fluency. And he spent uh, about a decade traveling Japan and collecting these kinds of folk stories, which he then uh, co published in a collection called Kwaidan. And so that focus uh, of uh, Japanese folklore and the occult is something that has kind of persisted through popular culture, both within Japan and transnationally, because of an Irishman. Um, up until that point, most of these stories were told through oral tradition only. And so to have a volume of these stories uh, was really significant culturally, even for Japan and Japanese writers. So it kind of, again, begs to question, you know, what is, what is national cultural identity? I mean, there are certain things that we can, I think, point to Obviously, where you have folklore, for example, that originates in a particular region of the world that is inspired by the kind of unique context of life in that society. Uh, but in a modern world and then in a postmodern world where all of these traditions start to blend together, where we have the ability to instantly communicate to one another through the internet and other digital communications, uh, how much longer can we really point to something and say that this is Japanese, or this is French, or this is American. Um, and I think those are, yeah. Yeah, just to, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the funny thing is like Hearn, Lafcadio Hearn, I believe was Greek Irish, right? And he began his writing career in New Orleans and, and in the Caribbean. So, you know, and he was fascinated with New Orleans ghost lore, right? So maybe he's reading Japanese yokai, you know, through a lens of New Orleans, you know, so it's, it's, it's fascinating just to think, you know, when, when you start to unpeel it all, it becomes much more weird and, and complex than, than, than you would even imagine. Yeah, and I love the idea, too, uh, when we start to talk about, like, the Japanese modern literature and uh, folks like Eruga Rampo and, and these kinds of lasting impacts of his work within uh, Japanese popular culture, but then you know, also thinking a little bit more about uh, the fact that something like that, again, doesn't exist unless you have first that introduction of Po to Japan and that kind of cultural recognition and the building upon the works and even just the reputation of someone like Po, that this would be then this popular culture reference that he would choose to hearken back to in his pen name. Um, but I guess, uh, you know, thinking a little more broadly about this idea of uh, cultural aesthetic and, I guess, essentialism, cultural essentialism. Um, Makoto, maybe you could comment a little bit about this idea. You know, you talked earlier in your comments about how it's a rarity in your experience as a theater artist who happens to be Asian to be standing on stage in a room with people who are your co-creators who are also Asian and Asian American who aren't doing something that's specifically Asian and aren't being asked to do something that's specifically Asian. Although obviously Hosokawa is Japanese and his maybe reading of Po comes from this, this no, no gaku type in inspiration. The fact that you were given the directive by Arya Umezawa, the theater director, to talk about and think about and actualize the vessel for that production to be seen in from this sort of non-essentialized perspective. Because I think too often within these spaces, uh, particularly actors of color are being essentialized based on race and based on the sort of stereotypical roles that exist within the canon. And these ideas then that get perpetuated through other aspects of popular culture. And to me, the, the work that you and Papa and Obvious Agency and, and a, a, your own company, Team Sunshine, um, all of those sort of push back on those notions of essentialism. Um, so just really curious to and that is hear more. Such a, yeah, that's such an interesting thing because um, it, makes, it makes me think so many things. Um, <clears throat> and I'll see if I can capture all of them. It makes me, it reminds me of one of my early mentors uh, in choreography. Uh, his name is Paul Turner. And Paul 
Paul used to be very active in Philly as a choreographer, and he's loud, gay, black, and just like angry and fantastic. And uh, I worked, I was a company member with him in 2004 through seven or something. And, um, and he, he was the one that, uh, that, so he was, so there's a thing in, in, uh, in dance, in concert dance, that's um, that he and many others, but we refer to as uh, suitcase dances, and which is like the the black American experience told through jackets and suitcases on stage. And you may have seen shows like this. And there's traveling, and there's you know diaspora. There's um, uh, there's having to to relocate or being uh, displaced, and that's all told through dance. And I feel like there's an Alvin Ailey piece like that too. Anyway, but um, and Paul was like, I don't want to do a damn suitcase piece, and he would say that because he felt like the dance community in Philadelphia and in New York, they were like, he felt like he was being asked. He felt like he was supposed to. He was like, as a black man, I have to do a damn suitcase piece. And he was really mad about it. And I didn't understand why back then. And uh, I understood a little bit, but I, I didn't understand why. I guess I didn't understand why he was so mad. I understand why he didn't want to do that. Um, I think about that. I think about um, me having to, there's a push and pull in my work uh, in the work, in any of the work I create. Uh, I always tell people I make Asian American art and regardless of what it is, regardless of what the project is, it's Asian American art because I'm Asian American, so it's just Asian American art. And, um, and I learned that because, I learned to say it and think about it that way because there's a uniqueness in it. And yet there's a, so there's a push and pull in that, is, is um, there's a uniqueness which is important and valuable and, uh, and marketable, honestly. And there's, uh, but then there's the push. Is that the pull? I can't tell which one's the push and pull, but uh, there's a push and pull in that like one, is, one has value and yet it, uh, it's a trap or it can be a trap. And uh, I've spent the past 17 years sort of navigating that in my career. Uh, I think about jumping to another thing that it makes me think about. Uh, I think about, it's either Chuck D or KRS-One. These are both MCs from, rappers from uh, a bit ago, but uh, 90s mostly. But um, one of those two, and I, it's too bad it's gonna be recorded because I can't remember which one it was. And I should know this, but uh, this is hip hop history. But KRS-One or Chuck D at one point was talking about Eminem the rapper, and was like, yes, black people should be mad as hell at Eminem, at his successes. This is probably in like 2003 or something that he said this in an interview. And he said, not because he's not a dope MC, because he's incredible. He's an incredible writer, he's an incredible performer. Black people, black rappers, and people that are hip hop consumers should be mad as hell at Eminem, because Eminem can come in here and be Weird and gross right out the bat. Just show up and be weird. And, uh, and black artists can't just do that. Back then, this is what they were saying. This is what one of those people that I can't remember which one it was, was saying. It was like, black artists can't just show up and be weird and sell millions and millions and millions of records. It becomes suspect. And so, but you have a white artist that comes in and does that. It doesn't matter that they're white or black or whatever, but there's a person that comes in and they get to be super weird and gross, and they're incredibly successful. And people should be mad about that. That, that the culture allows that to happen. And it makes me think about that, because it, there's a uniqueness to that person's ethnicity, their race. And that person, Eminem in this case, um, yeah, like utilize their incredible writing skills, et cetera, et cetera, but also their ethnicity and their race, and they became incredibly successful. And so there's a, again, a push and pull with the, the uniqueness and the marketability and the value in that. And at some point, it makes me, this is another thought, it makes me wonder, do we, uh, 
where is the line? Oh, it doesn't have to be a line. Oh, I figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, where is the line where we cross it collectively and say we don't have to, we don't have to call these things this anymore? And it's not a line. It's, uh, right, we don't collectively cross over a line. We individually can make the choice of how to receive things. Oh man, this is getting, this is getting deep. Um, I can make the choice to receive something as however, I know, I don't know either. I, I, we can make the choice individually as consumers, as receivers, as participants in, in sort of art and culture to receive it with all of our stuff. I, me behind me is all of my ancestry and all of my Japanese-ness and my dad, the chef, and my great, 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 great grand, grandfather who was a samurai. Like all that is behind me and I can view it through that, view anything I want through that lens at any time. And we can all choose to do that. Oh man, I, like, I wanna write really, really bad poetry about this right now. But, uh, those, are, those are some of the things that it makes me think of. But does that contra <laughs> stuff for you? <laughs> Yeah, Will, do you have any thoughts again on this idea of like this sort of mixture of uh, national or ethnic cultural inputs and how does that manifest then within this globalized transnational cultural environment that we all now inhabit? Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess I can sort of give my perspective as an academic, right? So, you know, and think about, I mean, I think we each have to kind of think, I mean, in this moment that we're in, we kind of have to each think about our own, you know, what what our own affiliations are, right? And what, what forces and, and have shaped us, right? As, as individuals and what opportunities we've had. Um, and, you know, I, I came into academia, you know, I, I had a chance, you know, very fortunate to go to Japan as a high school student and wanted to study about Japan, you know, um, a, a, in college. And, you know, that was an incredible privilege that I had a, a, at that time um, and managed to continue to pursue that. Um, but, uh, but, you know, also thinking about just institutionally how Japan was studied when I was in college and grad school and still to a large extent today, that when we talked about Japanese literature, it was really talked about as something that was its own thing, right? You know, that really kind of existed as a field of study that even though it has all of these clear influences from abroad, you can study it as its own thing and it's its own little academic compartment, right? Um, and, you know, area studies and study of Japan was really based on, you know, a kind of Cold War model, right? And had got funded because of Cold War, you know, issues, right? That, that there was a sense that the nation state needed to produce experts, right, on Asia, right? Because we're getting in all of these wars in Asia over and over again, right? So, um, so there, you know, I think that institutionally, you come from area studies, and Asia was kind of taken as an object of study, right, in the United States. Um, and people didn't really want to talk about, well, what is that relationship? You know, it's actually America has influenced Japan, you know, through imperialism, basically, right, through, uh, and, you know, has had fought a war with Japan, you know, and has occupied Japan in the post-war era, and it has all of this deep history, but I think American academia, you know, the academy, even though it was kind of produced by those same historical forces, and in some cases, you know, those teachers who were my teachers were, were people who were, you know, who learned Japanese and about Japan, you know, through the occupation era, right, and through participating in um, that history, right? But they didn't really want to talk about that, you know, those sort of historical forces, right? So I think, and, you know, the idea that 
again, institutionally in academia, Asian American or Japanese American literature was a whole nother category, right? And Asianists and Asian Americanists, there was some kind of mutual blood, bad blood there for a while, I think, that you know, Asian Americanists didn't want to be confused, right, with people who were Asia experts because they had their own, they were Americanists, right? They were studying American history and American culture. Um, so I think that gradually, you know, that um, Asian studies and Asian American studies have come to see that we can learn a lot from each other and in fact, those histories are so intertwined, you know, and that why don't we, why, why isn't there more dialogue between those, you know? So I think institutionally, it's not just the fact that there's all of this transnational influences, which I think we've all recognized for a long time, but institutionally, I think we have to sort of question where those boundaries are and try to break them where it makes sense to do so, and we can do so in respectful ways. Um, so I've been like trying to teach at my college like a new course on transnational Japanese literature and think about reading you know, Japanese literature alongside Japanese American literature and, and talking, thinking about imperialism and Japanese imperialism, right? And, and how Japanese imperialism is actually in some cases modeled on American imperialism or experiences of Japanese Americans with American imperialism, you know? So it's very intertwined when you start really looking at it and, and sort of peeling those layers of the onion. And I think academically, there's a lot we can all learn from that. Yeah. yeah, that's a fantastic point too. And I think it's great to, again, hear that the silos are starting to come down. I, I can attest that that's also happening a bit now at University of Pennsylvania as the Center for East Asian Studies has done a lot recently to incorporate Asian American Studies program um, into their dialogues. But um, I think uh, we're coming close to the end of our time. I just wanted to kind of summarize some of the things that we're talking about and then open it up for questions from the audience. Um, I think to contextualize this discussion within the opera, The Raven, which we are, have been kind of using as a starting point, there's sort of three unique things that are happening here. It's the first is there's this transnational exchange of Edgar Allan Poe as a source material, cultural input that's going to Japan and kind of uh, f fermenting over uh, hundreds so on years, right? That over the course of many different mediums, many different movements of Japanese art and popular culture and literature and stage and manga and cinema. And ultimately then at some point becomes this thought in the back of Hosokawa's mind to say, this is interesting to me and I want to do a piece of work in the context of a chamber opera. So that's really interesting, right? And then there's that conversation of moving that particular production from the Japanese context in which it was originally devised and bringing it to the United States and putting it on stage here in Philadelphia, but through the lens of a Japanese Canadian theater director. So it's this sort of response again of through the filter of a diasporic Japanese Canadian and Japanese American and other Asian Americans and other actors of color on stage getting to filter through that kind of experience of a transnational cultural exchange that has its roots in the United States but have been commented on and understood and reiterated through Japanese culture over 100 years, brought back to the United States and now seen through the lens of folks in this diaspora. Yeah, I think if, if a Japanese no company came here and saw this and then uh, created a, a response piece to it, like I feel like it would somehow close, <laughs> close the cycle or something. So in, in that sense, it's an extremely complex thing that we've like thought about, talked about, and executed here in, in, on the stage at the O22 Festival. So I mean, congratulations to the artists for undertaking this tremendous thing. But also, uh, I think it's important to keep all of this in, in mind when we understand, when we consume these sort of cultural products. They don't ever come from a single place. And I don't know that it's possible to really create something that comes from a single place when you're being influenced, as any global citizen is, by this incredible amount of globalized culture input that comes from throughout the world. And really, culture has always been this way. 
And the exchange of culture and the exchange of ideas has always transpired transnationally. It's just whether or not we've understood or accepted that process. Um, and again, to the extent that the conceptualization of nation statehood is still relatively new, um, I think we're all sort of grappling with that push and pull of like regional localized culture and now this larger globalized common culture that we're all really a part of, but also contributing to in different and exciting ways. So um, obviously this is just one small piece of a much, much larger conversation, but I hope that this discussion has sort of given you some things to think about. Um, if you haven't already seen the production, I, I hope that you do see it. And if it, you have seen it already, then hopefully this gives you a little bit more to kind of appreciate with regards to the complexity. Um, but again, I would like to open it up if anyone has questions. <coughs> yeah. Well, actually, I, I think <coughs> probably I don't know, 30 years ago, it was uh, business related, and the company I was doing business with took me to, to see a no performance, and I'm trying now to bring back <laughs> what I saw then. But, uh, you know, I have like this little glimmer of it. But, um, what I wanted to ask is um, about the dancer. And it, I, I thought she, she was amazing. And I couldn't find any credits for her in the program. And I don't know if that was, maybe I missed it. But um, it, it was dance, but it was obviously not traditional. It, so is that, I don't want to use the word typical, but is there that kind of dance or movement in no theater uh, in Japan, is that? Uh, so, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, Muyu, uh, Muyu, oh, I'm blanking on her last name. Muyu is her first name, uh, the dancer, and uh, she's credited with the ensemble, so not separately. So her name is listed in the program. And I think that was an intentional sort of like obvious agency, the organization that sort of worked with Arya on the Vessel, uh, Muyu is part of that side of the production. Um, and Muyu's training is, uh, she's uh, trained in China in contemporary, uh, contemporary dance, modern dance, as well as Chinese classical dance. Uh, she's got like 500,000 years of performance in her, in her DNA at this point, and she is absolutely incredible. I'm, I'm a dancer and a choreographer, and I watch Muyu, and I think that's like, that's incredible. Uh, as far as uh, that vocabulary used to know, I will transfer this to you. I, you know, I, I don't think that, I mean, I, I actually thought it was sort of interesting and re refreshing in a sense that I, I, I didn't feel like she was compelled to be like trying to mimic, right, no movements, which are very, there's a very, there's a very sort of clear sort of repertoire of movements and training of movements in, in for no actors who are really dancers um, as well as perform you know vocal performers and actors um, so I didn't see I didn't feel like there was a lot of of sort of direct kind of like trying to capture that no movements um, but I think that there were other perhaps Influ you know, that she, as you said, she herself has a Chinese dance background. You know, I felt that she might have been, in, you know, inspired um, to some degree by Buto, which is a modern Japanese dance form. We had time for one short question, and then we're going to have to end, unfortunately, because we're out of time. So I wanted to go back to the question that, um, the question that you were addressing in terms of cultural essentialism. And uh, one of the things that I find to be quite interesting is that um, Kosakawa, for whatever reason, has become the it composer from Japan. Uh, I've seen him present at the International um, Musicological Society. Uh, I've seen him you know, do the show in New York and here and, and, and everywhere. So he, he really gets around, but I don't think that many Japanese composers get around. And, you know, one can think of other examples like this in other music. So, for example, the one techno DJ that all the Europeans know is DJ Nobu. 
but they don't seem to know any other Japanese DJs, even though there are tons of them in Japan. So I'd be quite interested to hear from you guys as people who might have been involved in the production as to why is Jose Pala the person that um, American companies or foreign companies call to write any work as somebody from Japan? I have, I have uh, just a tiny bit of information and uh, you know, there'll be probably, maybe this can be answered a hundred ways and maybe this is one of them. I'll put it that way, um, is that um, uh, Hosokawa was uh, trained, was Western trained. His training is, what is it? Berlin, right, right. I was gonna say somewhere in Europe. Yes, right, so, uh, and then, it, right, in, in his career, during his career, in the middle of his career, something, then he sort of, uh, it's my understanding that he went to Japan and, uh, started to incorporate Japanese sort of traditional concepts and aesthetics into his composition. And thereby, some could say, uh, making his compositions more Japanese or more um, authentically Japanese. And I think that, again, this is one of a hundred ways to answer this, maybe, but my, my tiny guess would be that um, it's, it's that, like that he is, uh, that he is trained. He is Western trained with uh, a Japanese aesthetic, and that is like. Oh wait, I just thought of another way to answer this. But uh, that's that's probably very enticing. That's probably very attractive. Um, answer because um, what a lot of music theorists have focused on about his music is his um, concept of timing and temporality, which mm. they like to try to relate to Japanese cultural mm. concepts on law or, or what have you. That's cool. I, yeah, I, I just thought of another, another way to answer it, which is um, <laughs> when somebody becomes the it something, choreographer, composer, it's through a series of accidental slash strategic moves, and then suddenly they're it for a while. And, uh, and it's like certain lateral moves, certain, uh, certain commissions, and then suddenly you're visible in, on, a, on a stage, on a world stage, and then suddenly they become the name for a while. I mean, that, you know, that's just another way to answer that. Uh, that's all I got, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've a answered it probably as best as any of us could on this panel since we weren't actually involved with the selection of that. Um, if anything, though, I would say that probably, again, when you parallel to that idea of like the essentialism within the culture, I think there's this tendency as cultural presenters to kind of look at what has happened before across other contemporaries and colleague or institutions. And so if Hosokawa has been getting that type of recognition widely in the West, um, it doesn't really surprise me that he's then getting that recognition in this context as well. Um, but that is all the time that we have for our discussion. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And we hope that you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thanks again for coming.